There's yttrium, ytterbium, actinium, rubidium, aboran, gadolinium, niobium, iridium, and strontium, and silicon, and silver, and samarium, and bismuth, bromine, lithium, beryllium, and barium. I don't know if we've actually discussed the Harvard process in quite a bit of detail. It's actually a good opportunity to discuss again in one of the first videos of this playlist. We talked about developmental chemists, production chemists, or in different types of chemists. And now it's actually a good time to sort of give you a actual example of what a developmental chemist and production chemist. Because if you think about um, what we just discussed the whole time, the Harvard process, that was about you know, having knowledge of an equilibrium. So in this case, and you know, this is the nitrogen gas, three moles of hydrogen gas coming together to form two moles of ammonia. So that's the equilibrium. And you could obviously manipulate parts, right? So you could increase the pressure, you could increase the temperature or decrease the temperature, you could add a catalyst, etc., etc. So this is the job of a developmental chemist. He has to come up with the whole procedure, all the fine, fine details. So he has to figure out what pressure do we use best to increase the yield, right? What temperatures do we use that will give us a high rate of reaction, but not be so bad for our percentage yield? What catalysts do we use to help us lower the activation energy? And what procedures overall do we use that help us to do with having a safe procedure, a very cost-effective procedure, and to give us the highest possible yield of ammonia? Right? That's the, the job of developmental chemists. He comes up with this theoretical concept of what kind of procedures needs to be in place to make sure that we have the highest efficiency of our industrial procedure. And that was the job of the developmental chemist. So all the last couple of videos of you know fine-tuning this, doing this instead of that, increasing temperature or decreasing temperature, that would all be the job of the developmental chemist. Uh, the production chemist is the person who wants all these procedures in place. He's going to be the one who's actually inside or close to the actual facilities. This is the the harbor process facility where we have all of this being made. So where the procedure is being actually put into practice. And he's going to be monitoring. So one of his main roles is monitoring. So he's going to be either in front of a often a computer analyzing lots of data. So he gets lots of data. He has to make sense of all that data. He might go around the facility to look at different parts of the facility, at the pipes, if they're broken or anything like that. So that's the job of a production chemist. He has to look at, are we achieving the ideal yield? Right? So the developmental chemist wants to get a certain yield. Is Are the numbers actually stacking up? Are the numbers suggesting that we're doing what we want to be doing? Also, he has to look at the temperature and pressure. The developmental chemist has told him what temperature and pressure we should be at. He has to make sure that temperature actually stays the same. So there might be fluctuations. And if it goes too high or low, he has to adjust it to make sure it's proper. Also, he'll look, again, he has to look at the equipment. He has to see if there's any breaks or any other flaws in the equipment. And he has to look at the safety. You know, is there any safety concern on the actual facility? And he has to make sure if there is one, that he has a plan to deal with it. Right? So the developmental chemist comes up with the procedure. The production chemist oversees it, supervises the procedure. And both jobs are extremely important. And the reason why I mention all this is because the actual top point says, Explain why monitoring of the reaction vessel used in the harbor process is cru crucial and discuss the monitoring required. So we need to explain why the monitoring of the reaction vessel is crucial and discuss the monitoring required. So the reaction vessel is actually, specifically is the part where the catalyst is in. So the reaction vessel is sort of this part here. We've got a catalyst in it. There's pipes, so there's pipes in there, there is the catalyst, we have all of our reactants going through it, we have our reactants going through it, and our products being produced from it. So what he has to think about is pressure, temperature, ammonia yield, hydrogen nitrogen supply, and catalyst. And I'll cover all of this now. So it says explain why monitoring of the reaction methods is, is crucial and the types of monitoring required. So we'll talk about that now. So first of all, pressure. What happens if the pressure is too low? Well, if the pressure is too low, that means our percentage yield of ammonia goes down. So if it's ammonia, so if we have, let's say, instead of having 200, which is what we sort of aim for in most, in many plants, instead of having 200 atmospheric pressure or 20 millipascal, Let's say we only have, there might be a problem, we only have 160. That means it's less than ideal, and this will give us a less than ideal yield. 
Remember the Chartier's principle, if we have high pressure, that means we're going to favor the production of ammonia, which means we have a higher percentage yield. Now, what happens if it's too high? Well, if it's too high, that's safety concerns. The actual reaction vessel might blow, you know, it might blow up, and that could be a relatively big problem. Right? If it blows up, that means there's damage, and damage is bad. So we want to make sure it's not too high. Now, if it goes you know, above, you know, say, five, six hundred, probably even this, that atmospheric pressure will cause damage. So we don't have it. Want to have it too, too low? We don't have it too high. We need constant monitor pressure to make sure it's within that roughly that two hundred atmospheric pressure, which or whatever the product developmental chem sets decided it should be at. Why do we look at temperature? Remember what happens if it's too low? Well, if it's too low, that means the radio reaction will be problematic, right? Re radio reaction will go down, which means overall we will get less ammonia. If it's too high, not only will we have a decrease in the percentage yield, so we'll have a too big of a decrease in percentage yield, but also we're going to have an increase in potential for damage, right? So there's a the chance of damage will be increased when the when temperature is too high, because remember what temperature does? Temperature makes things move faster, particles move faster, and that means it's also going to affect the pressure. If the temperature increases, the pressure increases too. Remember, too high, too high pressure means the reaction vessel might blow up. So we want to make sure the temperature is not too low or too high. We want to make sure it's ideal, which is mostly in that 400 to 550 degrees Celsius range. Now again, we want to have an ammonia yield. So he's going to look at what comes out of that reaction vessel. Is the ammonia yield that we have targeted for, is that being achieved? Or is it too low? And if it's too low, if there's a problem with the ammonia yield, he has to figure out why. So it could be with something to do with the temperature being wrong or the pressure being wrong or maybe the supply of hydrogen and nitrogen is, is somehow wrong and the concentration of reactants is, is different. So he, if the ammonia yield is a problem, he has to figure out what the problem is and why it's, that it's been caused. What's happening in the reaction vessel that's causing this decrease in ammonia yield. Yet also really important is the hydrogen and nitrogen supply. Remember, these are our reactants, right? So we've got hydrogen gas here and nitrogen gas here. These are our reactants. So without these reactants, we're not going to be able to produce ammonia. So first of all, we need to have them in the correct ratio. And the ratio should be a 1 to 3 ratio. So this ratio is actually really important. We don't want to have it to too few um, nitrogen or too many nitrogen or too few hydrogen or too many hydrogen. We want to have 1 to 3 ratio because for every 1 mole of nitrogen, we need to have three moles of hydrogen to form two moles of ammonia. So we need to have that ratio. And if it's too, uh, too high or too low, that's going to affect our production. That's going to decrease our ammonia production. So we want to keep it at one to three for the ideal ratio. And again, it's going to be his job, the monitor, the, the production chemist, to make sure it stays at one to three. One to three ratio. He's going to have these different types of devices that measure all it, and he'll find out on his computer screen, it'll tell him what the ratio is at the moment. Now he also may, needs to make sure it's contaminate, contamination free. Remember we said that if, for example, there's a bit of um, sulfur, which there can be if something has gone wrong, if there's a bit of sulfur in the actual reactant, so if there's some sulfur here, what that's going to lead to is it's going to lead to a decrease in ammonia production. So a contamination of the reactants is going to lead to a decrease in ammonia production because basically poison the process. So if we remove, make sure that there's no sulfur at all, we're going to have no problem with the ammonia production. And it's also going to be a job of the actual production chemist. He's going to make sure that the supply of nitrogen and hydrogen is contamination free. And he's also going to make sure that the catalyst, which is inside the reaction vessel, is going to make sure that that's being observed and he's more specifically, he's going to make sure that it's still doing its job, because they have a life, they have a life, life, a shelf life, or a sort of work life over a couple of years, right? So I think it's like four to five years of where they're doing their job. So after four to five years, they have to be replaced. So it's not forty-five; it's four to five years, and after that, they have to be replaced. And that's going to be the job of the production chemist. Right, so these are the couple of things here. We've got to explain why the monitoring of the reaction vessel used in the hard process is crucial and discuss the monitoring required. Right, it's crucial because we want to make sure safety 
is really high. I'm just looking out the window and it's storming like crazy all of a sudden. Uh, so I better finish this before the lightning hits. But um, we want to make sure there's actually a high yield in terms of the ammonia. We want to make sure we get as much ammonia as possible. But also, at the same time, we want to make sure safety is, is still there. And that's one of the, that's the reason why we're monitoring, right? Safety is, should be there, and we want to make sure we get as much money as possible. And the types of monitoring, so discuss the types of monitoring. We will have, we monitor pressure, because if it's too low or too high, there's going to be problems. We monitor temperature. Again, too low or too high will affect the production and the safety of the reaction vessel. We want to make sure we observe our ammonia yield. Again, if there's a too low ammonia yield, that might mean there's some sort of problem, temperature, pressure, or catalyst problem. We don't know yet, we have to figure out. We also going to monitor the catalyst to make sure it's still doing its job. If it's too old, it has to be replaced. And it's also going to be monitoring the hydrogen and nitrogen supply. It's going to make sure the ratio is correct, the 1 to 3 ratio, because that means we're going to have higher ammonia production. And it's going to make sure it's contamination free because there's sulfur in the actual reactants. That means ammonia is not going to be produced. Hope that was useful. But yeah, I'm gonna this raining, so I'm gonna stop it here. Thank you for watching.